welcome Robert Smith, who's a, a passionate common disk packer and he's also the director of software engineering at Rigetti, which is one of the big quantum computing hardware uh, players in the universal quantum computing space. Um, and they're based in San Francisco, uh, or actually in Berkeley, San mm -hmm. Francisco. And he's going to talk about forest and open source quantum software development. Right, cool. Uh, I'm super happy to be here. Uh, my background is uh, very, very much in software. Only in the past few years did I kind of get into the quantum business. Uh, and so being at an open source conference uh, and seeing that quantum is here at the open source conference uh, is really exciting for me. Uh, before I start, I just want to understand the audience a little bit better. Uh, how many of you are not sort of professionally in quantum computing, not in academia, quantum computing in academia or anything like that. All right, that's, that's good. That's really great. Um, how many, so this is my personal, just kind of what I want to know. How many of you know anything about LISP? All right, that's pretty good too. That's more than I would expect. Cool. Uh, a little bit about Rigetti. Um, so we build, uh, Get the little mouse pointer out of the way. Uh, we build universal gate-based hybrid classical quantum computers. So these are machines that are not just, um, they don't just do quantum computations. They interact with the classical computer as well, very much in concert. Um, classical computer might produce results that affect the quantum computation. The quantum computer might produce results that affect, affect a classical computation. Um, uh, as uh, was said in the last, uh, in the keynote, uh, the quantum computers aren't really doing computations right now that exceed what a classical computer can do, but nonetheless they do interesting computations. They're doing real computations, they're not just, um, they're not just, you know, theoretical equations or anything like that. You can compute real things about the physical world, for instance. Um, we're a full stack company, so we do everything in house more or less, uh, all the way from the design of silicon chips, the fabrication of chips. Uh, we have our own fabrication facility, everything in between, all the way to building applications on top of the chip or on top of the computer. Uh, we have a very wide range of papers published. Um, again, basically any of these uh, horizontals here, uh, we probably have a paper in. Uh, and our flagship product is called uh, Quantum Cloud Services. So quantum cloud services is something that uh, we just released uh, publicly as a beta. Um, as far as I know, it's the fastest quantum programming environment available right now. Uh, it's about 30 times faster than uh, an HTTP-based service. Uh, this comes from a lot of different things all across the stack, and this is one of the benefits of being a full stack company. It's not just that we got some you know, clever hardware trick or, or something like that. It really took a combination of uh, infrastructure, hardware, and software to, to gain these speed ups. Um, so as a part of this, uh, as a part of the quantum cloud services, you get your own QMI. It's a virtual machine. comes preloaded with a bunch of uh, software, uh, including our Forest SDK. So Forest SDK is uh, the software development kit that includes a very powerful arrangement of software uh, to write, build, and execute quantum programs. This includes a compiler, a simulator, a Python API, uh, and a set of optional libraries uh, on top of that. So uh, pretty early on at Rigetti, I joined Rigetti when it was around 20 or so people. Uh, pretty early on at Rigetti, we were uh, very interested. I actually credit it to, to Will Zhang a lot, who, who planted the seed at the company uh, to try to maintain sort of openness in a lot of our ideas and a lot of our software and so on. So. Uh, being in kind of open source slash open standards isn't something that's uh, relatively new. We've been doing it for uh, the past three or so years. Uh, maybe one of the big milestones was about three years ago. Uh, we released an open standard for a quantum instruction language called Quill. So Quill is this assembly looking code. Uh, it's not assembly, it doesn't run natively on the machine. It requires further compilation, but it looks like an assembly code that describes hybrid classical quantum programs. Um, and we, we published a standard, and uh, a little bit to my surprise, certainly, uh, we saw all these little libraries popping up. Uh, somebody wrote something in Haskell, for instance, to construct Quill circuits. Uh, I myself, out of interest, wrote something in Lisp. Uh, somebody else wrote something in OCaml. Just all these things came out. Uh, and that sh sort of is a testament to kind of, you know, when you provide something that's open, that's well-specified, that's well-documented, uh, it gets adopted, and people are kind of interested in it. 
Uh, since the release of uh, the standard for Quill, we've you know, had a good handful of different open source libraries. Uh, all of these are homegrown or at least adopted by us. Uh, and then beyond that, we've um, you know, contributed back to any number of open source projects. Uh, one of my favorite was a uh, tool for editing CAD files. Um, we found a, a few bugs in it, contributed back. It's nice to you know, design these quantum circuits as you know, you know, within CAD and finding these things and being able to contribute back. <coughs> so I'll very briefly talk about kind of the force SDK. You can kind of think of it as a sort of layered architecture. Uh, like so, at the top you have your applications, the things you're building on top of the platform. Uh, this includes Grove, which contains a lot of different textbook algorithms, a lot of different things you'd find in uh, any sort of um, uh, course on quantum computing, for instance. Uh, we just released an alpha version of something called Force Benchmarking, which contains uh, a lot of very, very easy to read routines for how to benchmark and classify the quality of a quantum computer. Um, and then we have a bunch of partner apps, and these, this is kind of the layer where you would build if you were interested in building programs for your quantum computer, or for a quantum computer. Uh, below that is PyQuill. Uh, it's a Python library that allows you to write Quill programs. It contains a lot more than that. It contains an API to talk to the machine. It contains a good API for interacting with the compiler. It contains some mathematical routines if you want to translate sort of a mathematical problem into a quantum computing problem, and so on. Uh, below that, we have uh, a little RPC framework uh, just to have everything in the stack communicate with each other. Uh, below that is a compiler called Quill C. This is the compiler that'll take uh, Quill code and compile it to the native gate set of the quantum computer, the native instruction set of the machine. Um, on the right here, you could imagine this, this box right here going down and down and down. That's, you know, that's where you actually start executing things on the machine. That gets to the firmware level, that gets into the control system level, and so on. Uh, but to the left, uh, you can replace all of that, of course, uh, with a simulator. That's going to be a lot slower than the real machine, of course. Uh, but serves as a good method for debugging and so on. So there we have uh, something called the QVM, the Quantum Virtual Machine, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and PyQVM, which is something built into PyQuill. Um, it's a uh, simulator written in Python. Um, henceforth in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, two main components here, uh, the compiler um, and specifically the QVM. So the QVM, um, it seems like everybody and their brother and sister and dog has kind of made a simulator these days. There's a billion of them online. Uh, simulating a quantum computer, it's kind of a fun problem to work through. Uh, it's, a, it's a thing that you need to do if you're going to be working with uh, quantum computing at all. Um, but there is a lot of great things that you can put into a simulator to make it um, more efficient, to make it more useful, to make it better for debugging, and so on. Uh, so our simulator, uh, the one that we call kind of the QVM, uh, is very, very high performance. Uh, if you can throw it on any machine, I mean, you know, I think the biggest we've thrown it on is something that has like 12 terabytes of memory and, you know, four socket motherboard with, you know, something like 224 uh, logical cores or something like that. Um, and it'll use all of it. Uh, it's completely multi-threaded. It's a good way to heat up your house if that's what you're aiming to do. Um, it can execute the entire Quill language. It does all the classical, all the quantum stuff. Um, it has lots and lots of different ways to execute programs, kind of the standard ways do something called standard pure state evolution. It kind of assumes that your computer is uh, perfect, that has no errors, that it's, uh, you know, kind of living in that, you know, fairy tale land. Uh, but then you have these other execution modes like the stochastic pure state evolution, full density matrix simulation if you want that, um, and, and some other things. Uh, I haven't personally found particular use for them, but stuff like the path integral formulation, if you want to compute just a single amplitude of your exponentially sized state. Like I said, it can simulate perfect and imperfect quantum computers, but the thing I'm most excited about about the simulator is actually, as a part of the simulator, it contains a compiler that compiles the Quill code into native instructions of your computer. So it's not trying to interpret the instructions, it actually compiles it all to machine code. Uh, and because of that, uh, you get really, really fast execution, sometimes outperforming some state-of-the-art simulators, you know, written in, you know, the finest, you know, toothpick and, and tweezers, you know, C code, uh, sometimes by 2x because it dynamically 
uh, it's able to do what a compiler does. Uh, and so I want to show a little demonstration of that, just a real quick one. So if I run the QVM program, uh, I'm going to say verbose, and I'm just going to run one of the stand standard benchmark modes, which computes a GHZ state, uh, an entangled state on, say, I think the default is 26 qubits. So if you see it run, it, you can see each gate, these gates over here, the Hadamard at the top, C0, it's taking about 500 milliseconds on my laptop per gate. Um, we'll let it get to the end, just so you can feel how long this stuff takes. Uh, to compare on a real actual quantum computer, each of those gates would take on the order of maybe 50 nanoseconds or so. So you see the runtime at the end was about 20 seconds, and all of this was without compilation. So if I tell it to compile, what it's going to do is take the Quill program that was uh, that's being benchmarked here, it's going to compile it to machine code and then run it. And so if we do that, you just see the difference is a lot, and we just you know got 10x speed up uh, just by pre-compiling the circuit. I want to move on from the simulator and talk about our compiler, which I'm even more excited about. Uh, so as far as I understand, uh, Quill C is the only truly sort of general purpose uh, fully automatic optimizing compiler, which means it's sort of turnkey. You can run the program. Uh, it'll compile. It doesn't need any extra information. You don't need to give it specific steps on how to compile or anything like that. You give it your program, and it'll compile to a specific architecture. Uh, it was built with portability in mind. Uh, of course, we use it at Rigetti Computing to compile for our architectures, uh, but we were trying to build it as a, as a general purpose tool because uh, you know, we design different chips, we try out different gate sets, uh, and every single time we do that, we don't want to have to like rewind and, and figure out how to recompile our programs and everything. Uh, it can compile any unitary gate, at least any unitary gate that feasibly fits in memory and that you have time to compile for. Uh, so, you know, two, three, four Q gates, it doesn't matter. Um, and most interestingly, it has a lot, in it, and we're still adding to it, of course, uh, lots and lots of different ways of, um, of optimizing your program. It does a lot of things that have a lot of similarity to uh, classical compiler theory. Uh, so it does something similar to register allocation. It tries to figure out what qubits, what actual physical qubits it should use given your logical qubits in the program. It does something similar to people optimization. It'll scan sections of your code and try to compress or optimize them. Uh, flow analysis, when you have classical portions of your program, when you have jump statements and loops and if statements and whatever, uh, it analyzes the control flow of your program. It does all the classical stuff like dead code elimination and all that. Um, and then for some cases, like two qubit gates, it actually has routines for doing optimal compilation. It will, it will compile it in the best way that you know, mathematics has proven to be the best. Um, like I said, I'm a software person. I've been writing software since I was like eight years old. Uh, and it's definitely one of the most interesting pieces of software that I've been able to work on in my career, me and my colleagues. Uh, so I can show a little demo of this as well. Um, we kind of follow the standard of being very Unix-y with the application. So just by default, uh, if you run it, it's going to take input from standard in. If I make like a bell state, for instance, and end it, uh, it compiles it by default to one of our eight qubit uh, rings that we have. So it compiled that Hadamard and C naught at the top to that program out there. It turned it into Z rotations, X rotations, and CZ. So in this case, uh, the default chip that it compiles to is one where CZ is the gate that can operate between edges. Um, one of our researchers at work uh, was messing around with the bernstein vazirani algorithm. Uh, which, for those unfamiliar, contains kind of this portion of the algorithm where you have to define something called an oracle. Uh, and depending on what your goals are as a researcher, maybe you're not trying to think about exactly how to construct this oracle. Maybe you're just, I don't know, trying to get your work done and you just want to try running it on the quantum computer. Uh, so what he did is he defined this giant matrix. Uh, that's what all these ones and zeros and all this stuff are. And then his actual program. So you see he does a bunch of, he does an X gate, a bunch of Hadamards. Uh, this giant five qubit um, operator and so on. Uh, and so if I cat uh, Bernstein Vazirani into <coughs> Quill C, and I'm going to make it measure gate depth and, and all of that, 
it'll think about it for a second and it gives the answer. So it, it decomposed this five qubit gate into a bunch of gates. We can see at the bottom it compiled it into a circuit that's of depth 2,746 gates, uh, which is way too many to execute on any qu current quantum computer for the record. Uh, but it starts giving it an idea of how this circuit would actually be realized uh, on the real machine. Uh, so one point that, that I like to make is that I really, really believe in automatic compilation. Um, sometimes I feel that, that some folks in the field are maybe like in the 1950s or something where I know our, our quantum computers currently aren't these machines that can execute hundreds or thousands or millions of gates yet. Like we're still kind of poking around with, you know, gates measured between 10 and 100 qubits. We're still looking at gate depths that are, you know, measured, you know, still on, in, on both your hands. And it is reasonable to construct programs by hand that way. Uh, but in general, to not have a tool that you can use to, to study the mathematics of a problem, to debug things, to even see how it decomposes into you know, the actual native code of your machine, um, I, think it's, I think it's not good to have such a tool. Uh, I also think that computers are just exceedingly good at doing what they do. I mean, compilers these days, like GCC, Clang, all of those, they're amazing. They're incredible. If you can see what, like, Intel's Fortran compiler does, it does amazing things. Uh, and it's a real testament that computers are really good at, at figuring things out, at calculating things. Uh, so I do have this belief that, like, if we're able to, like, competently write C for small microcontrollers that contain, you know, K of RAM, uh, then we can write Quill or some other instruction set for a quantum computer that passes through a compiler. Uh, is Quill C perfect at this? And is it like outperforming like hand compiled circuits? No. Uh, but can Quill C compile a circuit faster than you could? Almost surely yes. Sometimes circuits take like, I don't know, three days by hand to figure out even what, what to do. So I want to give a little example to show what Quill C even thinks about. So if I pass the verbose option, I'm going to compile this bernstein vazirani circuit again. But this time I'm going to say, just tell me everything you're thinking, compiler. And this is everything. I'll, of course, maybe scroll after it stops thinking, or I'll just control C it. You can see uh, here it's... It's going through, it's looking at different subsequences. Here it's looking at Rx, Rz, Rx. It's going to try to collapse that in some way. Uh, and it just continues until it, you know, it just tears your program apart. Um, lots and lots of interesting stuff. I like seeing the compiler think um, because it, again, reminds me that it's smarter than I am. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about what even a compiler target for a quantum computer looks like. Generally, you have a graph of qubits that are connected in some way physically on a chip. Somebody actually etched metal or something into the chip uh, to link these qubits together. So you have a graph of qubits. Each single qubit can have some operation on it. Usually for superconducting qubits, you're firing some microwave pulse. Uh, for example, in Quill, you could have an Rx pi over 2 gate or an Rz, totally parametric or fixed. Uh, each qubit pair can have operations. Uh, some example gates are CZ, C0. Uh, example parametric gate is C phase, where you can actually give it a parameter. Um, and then there are even gates that happen on qubit triplets or quadruplets and whatever. Uh, and one of the uh, you know, examples that I know is the molmer sorensen gate for ion traps, where you can actually perform a gate simultaneously on, on many qubits. Um, Importantly, though, it may be that, depending on the design of your quantum computer, different qubits might have different operations tuned for them. So we could imagine a four-qubit quantum computer. I mean, this is crazy. I don't think anybody would actually build this, to be clear, uh, where each qubit here has some single qubit operations, but each qubit pair has a different set of native operations. So what this diagram is showing is that qubit 0 and 1 may support a CZ operation on them. Qubit 0 and 2 might only have a C not only in one direction, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. And so we designed Quill C to accommodate chip designs that may have this. Uh, and so Quill C can compile a circuit there, and like I would challenge you to try to construct a GHZ state on an architecture that has this. I mean, I don't know, it'd be a waste of time, I think. It's probably a waste of time to make the chip too. So for FOSDEM, kind of as a testament to this, we actually ported Quill C to what we know about Google's bris bristlecone architecture, which is 72 qubits. Uh, we ported it to IBM's uh, IBM QX5 chip. 
again, what we could learn about it from papers online and everything. Any program that was written in Quill, any program that works in Grove, anything at all will compile to uh, any of our chips uh, to, again, what we could find about uh, the Bristlecone chip by Google, IBM QX5 chip. Uh, but not only that, it will actually try to optimize for those architectures. Um, it can work with the full chip, or you can actually select subgraphs of that chip, and it will compile for those. Um, and again, as far as I know, I don't really know of other compilers that are able to, to kind of do this job. So as a little demo, uh, I actually wrote a program uh, with this Molmer Sorensen gate. Uh, if I look at it, you can see this crazy, crazy big gate. I think this one's on, yeah, four qubits. The program down here is just doing Molmer Sorensen on four qubits. So if I cat Molmer Sorensen into Quill C, um, I'm going to show the gate depth. And I'm going to compile it for our 8Q ring. It'll do something. So gate depth is about 319. Uh, if I do ISA bristlecone, bris, if I can spell it right, bristlecone, it'll think about it more. And I actually found a smaller gate depth, not by a lot, but a little bit. Um, we could do it for IBM QX5. And by the way, this argument here, this ISA argument, is actually parametric. You can supply it a file to describe the chip that you have um, instead of like baking it into the compiler. So this one, it, it like doubled the gate depth. It took, it took 600 gates. Um, I want to show one last thing where we have some advanced features of the compiler um, uh, that can even optimize it more. So uh, the argument is enable state prep, enable state prep reductions. So again, like a normal compiler, you know, if you're compiling C code and you pass O3 or uh, minus F fast math or whatever, uh, we have similar things. This argument here says compile the program and assume that we're starting in initial zero state. Typically, that's what you assume when you write a quantum program. Uh, and if you can make that assumption, uh, it'll actually take that into account in the compilation process. Uh, it'll partially simulate it, and we actually get down to a gate depth of a third uh, of what we got before. So there are all different ways you can coax the compiler into compiling things um, and get more and more efficient circuits. So QVM and Quill C are free to download. We just released uh, the Windows version. Um, we, for the QVM, we do have an open source alternative. Like I said, uh, the Pi QVM. It doesn't have all of the things, but it is uh, licensed under Apache 2. Uh, it's much slower if you're doing it for lots of qubits, but if all of your work is in Python, it's actually much faster if you're doing one or two or three qubit computations because there's no overhead uh, communicating with this external process and so on. Uh, and there's no real alternative to Quill C. And maybe in that case, uh, if you don't want to use uh, this thing, then you can you know, compile things by hand or, or use some of the more manual alternatives. So I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of from a startup perspective uh, open and closed source software. Um, and so it's a little bit tricky at a startup, like what you should decide to do uh, when you want to work in software, uh, especially when the startup is uh, small, like Rigetti, and when all of your competition is quite large. Uh, from the perspective of open source, there's a lot of great things. Uh, languages should definitely be open sourced. Uh, it's nice when you have a language that's open source and APIs because people can help develop them and so on. <clears throat> it's good when your RPC framework is open source because that means people can plug into your architecture in various ways. Uh, and open source allows us to like understand what customers actually want and use more. On the other hand, uh, for a company, again, like ours, when you develop a lot of great IP and everything, uh, it's not something that you necessarily just want to give away. It's something that, that you want to kind of hold close to yourself. Uh, it's something that you can use as competitive advantage. Um, I actually don't really want to waste time talking about it because I'm just kidding anyway. <laughs> uh, so actually what I want to do is um, kind of live at FOSTEM, open source Quill C and, I mean, why not? Which one is this? Quill C. Is it going to make me? <laughs> so 
So Quill C, hopefully, should be visible to you. Who wants the license? Uh, QVM, let's... I think QVM became public. There shouldn't be the private symbol anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think it's public now. Um, so anyway, feel free to start looking at the code. Uh, all of the code is uh, licensed under Apache 2. Uh, there is one little front-end uh, UI component that's AGPL. Uh, so no other licenses in there, no EULAs, no anything. It should be all free and open source. So uh, you guys are truly the first to know. It wasn't announced or anything any earlier, and you saw it with your own eyes. So. So I'm American, and hopefully nobody like mistook my shirt for being like Colonel Sanders or something. Uh, my shirt is, in fact, John McCarthy, uh, who was the inventor of Lisp. Um, and uh, early on, uh, we wrote the QVM, an initial prototype in Lisp, and the compiler in Lisp. Um, I don't think many of the innovations that we've had could have happened if were it not originally written in Lisp. Um, we don't have teams of, uh, you know, tens or hundreds of, of developers. Uh, originally, the team was, the software team was actually like two or three people way back when the company was 20 people. Uh, and developing in Lisp was pretty time and money efficient, more or less. It's very snappy to develop. Um, moreover, like quantum computing is an interesting field in that not I don't think anybody has really figured out a great expressive syntax for expressing programs, for being able to take an idea in one's mind and actually convert it into something uh, that, that runs on a machine. I mean, Quill and, and Chasm and all of these things are good starts, I think. Uh, they describe a machine representation of a program, uh, but they don't necessarily make it easy to take an idea you know, in one's mind and put it on paper. And so uh, Lisp is a wonderful substrate for testing different syntactic abstractions, different ways of arranging characters on a screen in order to express some type of computation. The real, real, real reason, though, is that uh, a compiler, an optimizing compiler, I don't know if anybody's hacked on you know, an optimizing compiler before, uh, but they're very difficult to debug. If you get a wrong answer, you put in, let's say we were compiling that Mulmer Sorensen gate, and at the end we detect that's the wrong answer. Like, where do you start to even debug something like that? Uh, and so uh, in Lisp, in particular with Emacs and Slime, which are both also free software, uh, you can inspect everything. You can open up everything live while the code is running. Uh, while the compiler is running, you can actually open a REPL and inspect all of the state inside the compiler, inspect what it's doing, how it's working, all of that stuff. Not just verbose <laughs> printing out on the screen, but actual interactivity. Um, you know, and there's kind of the usual argument of, you know, it's Lisp, Lisp, so maybe it's hard to learn or something like that. Uh, almost all of our programmers, barring me and I think one other, uh, were professional Lisp programmers prior. Uh, and most people are productive within a few days. It's not like a purely functional language or anything like that. If you want to mutate state and do all that stuff, you can absolutely do it. Uh, I have to do it for the QVM to make it efficient. Um, so most people can learn it. And if you're interested in learning it, there's a free book. It's been out for... I don't know how long now, 10 years or so. Practical Common Lisp, if all of you probably are programmers already. Um, so if you want to check it out, great book. So if you find yourself wanting to be in superposition with a beer at some point, um, I invented this beer plus you over root two challenge. Um, if anybody, again, you guys are the first to know, kind of the first three people, if you solve any of the issues on GitHub, we tried to even internally keep a list of issues. If you fix a bug, if you just make any interesting contribution, um, I'm happy to have a beer with you. It'll be on me. Um, I should say thanks to uh, all of my colleagues at Rigetti, but in particular, uh, I'd like to give thanks to Eric Peterson. He's one of the principal architects of the compiler. Um, he's also an algebraic topologist, so he thinks about like chips as like you know, n-dimensional simplices and all this stuff that doesn't make any sense. Um, Mark Skillbeck, Lauren Capitoludo, uh, Will Zhang, Chad Rigetti, uh, and the rest of the team really for, for supporting building this effort and for really thinking about quantum software engineering as like a thing unto itself. Uh, my email's down there. Uh, the code on GitHub is rigetti slash qvm and rigetti slash quillc. 
Uh, and we do have a Slack channel. Uh, if you go to Rigetti slash community, you can find the link to our Slack channel. I'm on it. A lot of other people are on it. Happy to chat about this stuff. And uh, thank you all for listening. It was really fun. Happy to take questions. So feel free to drill rubber. Yep. So two things. Mm -hmm. First of all, you said many times that uh, Quilcy is the only compiler of its kind. Not correct. Cambridge Auto Computing Ships broke a uh, project called Ticket, which is very similar to almost everything you mentioned. It's a Python module rather than a mm -hmm. Python. But my actual question is about the simulator. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned Quilcy is um, platform independent. Yes, that's right. Is the same true of the simulator? Can I simulate the IBM 2X file? Uh, so the simulator is going to just simulate a Quill program. Oh, yes. Uh, so the question was, uh, well, first there was a comment saying uh, that, uh, that I said that the compiler was only of its kind. And, um, and this gentleman said that there, are, there is some other software that ha provides a lot of similar features. Um, and then the question was, uh, does the, is the simulator general enough to support other architectures, like the IBM QX5, for instance? Uh, the simulator uh, kind of develops from a theory of something that we wrote in the Quill paper called the quantum abstract machine. So it's a simulator for an abstract machine. It's a classical simulation. It doesn't restrict itself to any particular <laughs> gate or architecture. Well, whatever gate you throw at it, it will simulate. Uh, it will not error if you say, uh, I'm doing this gate on this architecture. Uh, presumably, you would pass it through the compiler first before simulating it if you wanted to restrict it to the gates of that architecture. With that said, however, uh, for instance, with our chips, uh, we do develop noise models that are you know, similar or at least somewhat characteristic of, uh, of our chips. And you can supply that to the QVM uh, and it will be able to it will be able to simulate that, but otherwise there isn't any like hardline restriction on on the gates that it simulates. No. Yep. In, in terms of practical efficacy, in, in what um, fields uh, have you applied the quantum uh, computing? So. Yeah. So I don't think I'm the best person to answer this. I think you'll. Oh, yes, I keep forgetting. Uh, what fields, uh, in terms of practical applicability, uh, what fields is quantum computing sort of good or useful for? Uh, I don't think I'm the uh, greatest person to answer this question. I think uh, I definitely want to learn a lot from the people here. Uh, but my take on it is uh, there are two things that, that we've definitely been focusing on, two things that seem to be popular in the field. Uh, quantum chemistry, simulating dynamics, simulating uh, different aspects of molecules finding energy states and, or, or energy levels and so on, uh, and optimization problems, usually finding the maximum or minimum of some constrained optimization problem, I would say. Uh, so that ties into logistics and, and what have you. But I do want to reiterate, we haven't solved a problem on a quantum computer, again, that I know of that like outperforms something that we've computed classically. We've done great proof of concepts, you know, the kind of almost the hello world of quantum computation almost seems to be computing um, the energy of like a dihydrogen molecule at different bond distances. That's something you can compute today, um, uh, but that's also something that my laptop can compute. So, but those seem to be the promising areas. Thanks. Yep. Um, there is uh, the movement uh, in cryptography. It's called post quantum computer, uh, computer uh, resistant mm -hmm. algorithms that are basically. Uh, they are finding the ways how to develop the cryptography uh, crypto functions mm -hmm. that are resistant to uh, quantum computers. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, uh, I think the first question is that uh, I guess uh, also there is quite a good field uh, of application of quantum computer <coughs> operations in cryptography. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, the question is kind of what's the state of post-quantum crypto? Uh, I actually don't know anything about it, uh, and I think we have a talk later uh, that's going to be about it. So that's definitely something I'm interested in hearing about as well. Yep. I have a question for, about uh, the Quill language. So yes. You say, uh, you almost answered, but you say this is a kind of assembly language. So mm -hmm. when you have the binary compiled mm -hmm. 
is cool to say, is there a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship with the code? I mean, yeah, can right. I, uh, dump like this code? Yeah, right. Sure. The, the question is, I said Quill is like an, it's like an assembly-like language. Is there like an equivalent of like the end binary that would be like loaded into memory where it actually gets executed? Uh, Quill, like other sort of uh, big air quotes assembly quote unquote languages are not true assemblies. They're not languages that run native on the machine. Uh, generally not even a binary encoding runs native on the machine. Uh, in the end, these things, at least with current control systems at and on microwave devices, to be clear, superconducting devices that are driven by microwaves, usually in the end, the, qu the, the Quill program will be something general that has all these, you know, funny gates. Uh, like if I go back and look at this, you know, this Mulmer Sorensen thing, like even though it looks like assembly, that's definitely not something uh, any superconducting computer will run. An ion trap or some can run this natively. Um, but not any superconducting chip. And so what happens is this passes through a compiler and you get Quill back out, but this Quill is now in one-to-one -one mapping with what your machine will run. Generally after that, you're going to pass it to another sort of translator, almost like a true assembler now, which gets turned into code that runs uh, on your control system. Even when it gets on the control system, however, it's not going to be like one single binary that runs single threaded. Oftentimes, since qubits can be excited in parallel, you're actually loading this code onto a bunch of things that are driving a bunch of different uh, uh, D to A converters and A to D converters for readout and so on. So there is a little bit more that has to happen after this for a compilation. Yep. Well, first of all, congratulations for open sourcing. Yeah, thanks. And the question is when you said uh, 30 times speed up yes. the cloud service, what was the metrics you had in mind? Yeah, so uh, one of the main metrics, uh, there are a few metrics. Uh, but one of them uh, where like the 30x thing came from was uh, one of the popular things that we do. There's an algorithm called, sorry, the question was, where did the 30x come from? I stated 30x speed up before. Where did that come from? So, uh, yeah, so generally the comparison was uh, kind of the realm of HTTP-based services where you construct a job of some sort. You have a program that you'd like to run. You ship it off to, you know, some service ingesting this job. It processes it, packages up the answer, sends it back to you over the Internet. And perhaps for a lot of programming in quantum computing, you either have to do that a lot because maybe you're scanning over a range of things or your program itself is actually changing frequently. Uh, you might be generating a new circuit for every run of your, of your program. So you might be optimizing. You might, let's suppose you're finding the maximum of something. You construct an initial program. You send it. You get the answer back. You evaluate whether that was good or bad. Maybe it's not good, so you take a step in another direction, construct a new circuit, send it, receive it. So those types of use cases uh, were what we were comparing to, specifically uh, VQE and QAOA algorithms, if you're familiar with those names. That's what we are comparing it to, where the speed ups come from are locality with the machine. Uh, on a QMI, you're actually running local to the chip itself. Your, your virtual machine is actually resident on the machine with the control system. Uh, 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 what is it called? Uh, fast reset with fast feedback or active reset is another one where we can zero the state of the machine by kind of forcing it to be zero. We can send pulses in, measure, and, and bring it down to the zero state as opposed to kind of stepping off in the background and letting the machine kind of slowly get back. So you can really iterate your program fast. And the third thing that we introduced is something called parametric compilation, where the compiler itself not only takes a fixed set of gates, but can actually take a parametric description of your gates, where you have unknown variables, and still compile it into your native gate set. And with that, with parametric compilation, that means you don't have to compile each loop around uh, when you hit the actual hardware. And so that's kind of where the speed ups came from. Those are the problems that we compared to. Yep. Native gate set, so like to find my own native gate set and run it on uh, QVM. We'll see. Yeah, so QVM will execute anything, whatever you throw at it, whatever gates you throw at it, that'll be fine. So there's no restriction there. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't think I'll get it right. Um, <laughs> Q 
can QuillC and the QVM operate with different native gate sets? Uh, QVM will run anything. Uh, any gate set, it doesn't matter as long as it understands the actual representation of the gate. Uh, QuillC, uh, I would say mostly yes. Uh, QuillC is able to operate with most of the gates that show up in literature, uh, rotation gates, you know, a big handful of, of two qubit gates. It's relatively straightforward to extend it with more two qubit gates. Uh, we had to do that when we were porting it for the IBM architecture. We had to go through a process of making sure at every step along the way we knew how to uh, optimize for those gates and so on. Uh, out of the box, you can't say uh, compile for uh, my wacky two qubit Mulmer Sorensen and uh, don't do any rotations, do these, you know, funky, I don't know, one qubit operations or something like that. The compiler would need to be told a little bit more about that, so out of the box it won't get that. Uh, but if it falls into any of the gates that are in sort of the general super superconducting regime, like any of the I-swap, parametric I-swap, all of those things, uh, it does work out of the box. Am I missing anybody? Yep. Uh, I think you partially answered, but um, you said that you provide uh, personal quantum machines in uh, cloud services. Yes. Uh, is there, um, are there backend with a true quantum acceleration, or is it all uh, uh, like a big simulator on a classical cluster? Or something? <laughs> the question is, uh, these uh, quantum machine images, um, is it all just simulator, or does it have a real backend? Uh, actually, the major point of it is the real backend. Uh, the simulation is more of a bonus. Uh, in fact, we just load a QVM onto the things, and you can run the QVM, uh, you know, just like a normal Unix program. I mean, what you can do is, you know, run it as a service, and now you can, you know, connect up to it. So the simulation is something that you kind of get for free. The real point of the QMIs is so that these virtual machines can lay resident with the quantum hardware itself, and you get full 100% control. It's not being mediated. You're not in a queue, anything like that. You get sort of immediate one-to-one uh, -one access with the machine. Okay. And so my question was, uh, how do you share the, those uh, resources between all the machines you get access? Yep. Uh, so the question is, how do we share those resources across several machines? Uh, it's just coarse-grained booking. You go, we have something called, QC, we have a QCS command line app, which is also open source. Uh, you can do QCS reserve, and you reserve a block of time where the machine is yours and only yours. And so if it's available, you can get it. Uh, we also allow booking on uh, what we call certain sub-lattices. Um, I, don't, I don't remember if there's a little cute image of a little lattice. Yeah, you can see this guy pulling a little lattice, quote unquote, out from the uh, 16Q ring. Uh, you can book smaller chunks of the machine um, and operate on just those. I think that's it for time, right? You might have question, like one more question. Okay. Who else? Yep. If I understood correctly, compilation involves an optimization problem <coughs> minimizing the ticket length. Which yes. Is, uh, heuristic. What, is it, uh, what kind of optimization problem is it? Uh, so the question is, uh, compilation involves some type of optimization problem. What heuristic uh, does it use or what different heuristics does it use? I want to give the snarky answer and say read the source um, now that it's available. Uh, but it actually uses a lot of different things. So it depends exactly what it's compiling. Um, and so a good amount of it, I probably can't scroll back to it, a good amount of it is doing uh, people re rewriting. So it actually has a bunch of rewrite rules. And this is probably the easiest thing to add to the compiler. So if anybody has like a cool circuit identity that they like, uh, they can put in the compiler, and the compiler will suddenly know about it and be able to apply it automatically. So finding sequences of gates and shortening them, sometimes it just, met, it, sometimes it just multiplies the gates out and just does an optimal 2Q compilation, for instance. If you have a bunch of 2Q gates kind of in a row, it's just going to multiply them out and then do a re-expansion on them. And then lastly, um, in some cases, it actually has to do like a, a stochastic gradient, not stochastic, just a gradient ascent or something for... Um, for certain types of compilation, but definitely not enough time to get into that. Lots and lots of different optimization problems in the compiler, certainly. All right, let's thank the speaker one more time.